Our call today is going to be an introduction to the upcoming guideline changes taking place uh, effective October 1st. Uh, this session will be limited to about 45 minutes to an hour absolute tops uh, with a second session to follow on Thursday. And uh, the guidelines have been distributed via email to everyone. And from now till October 1st, these guidelines are in transition, meaning the official release of the guidelines are on October 1st. However, we are looking and potentially uh, categorizing some existing loans into the new guidelines uh, in this time frame. Uh, today's call is going to be focused uh, on our bank statement programs across the board and introduction of new programs uh, that you have uh, received via email. The official release date of these guidelines, although they will be effective October 1st, for purposes of reference, please note that all the guidelines have a September 18th revised date on them. So if you open up your PDF and you will find on the index, uh, you will find a series of uh, programs on the page. And on the left-hand side box, you will find the bank statement programs. At the present time, uh, we have a different mix of bank statement programs and guidelines. And effective of the, as of the new guidelines, we're introducing the new elite bank statement programs. The prior programs that already existed were the 5,012-month Bank Statement Plus program, the 5,024 BS, and the 5,024 BS NP. The introduction of the LEAD program is creating a secondary 12-month Bank Statement program and uh, another 24-month Bank Statement program. Um, the purpose of introduction of new programs uh, are very apparent, but I'm going to spell them out. We are constantly monitoring uh, and analyzing uh, credit profiles and borrowers' interest rates, and we want to offer a complete set of programs that address and provide solutions for every type of borrower with every credit grade and financial profile. With that being said, the elite the elite programs, which by the way, does also have a full doc elite program, but we're not going to be discussing that today. Uh, the elite program is geared towards uh, the high end borrowers and lower LTV loans. So effectively, we're looking for a borrower that has superior credit, higher FICO scores, and has either more equity if it's a refinance, or a higher down payment. As a result of this, they're able to obtain uh, superior pricing. The rate sheets for these programs have not yet been released. However, under the elite programs, on a bank statement as well as full doc programs, we are looking at interest rates on five-year fixed product starting in the force. So it's putting an opportunity for us this is creating an opportunity for us to provide solutions for higher end borrowers um, and provide more competitive pricing to the top tier bank statement borrower. Several things that we need to discuss, and, and it will be discussed on this call, is the, some of the guidelines to be aware of um, on the elite program. In addition to that, concurrent to this new release, we have also modified and enhanced our guidelines on the prior programs. So you will find in the guides, you will be able to identify some changes to guidelines that have taken place by paying attention to the highlighted in yellow sections on the matrices and guidelines, which provide some insight as to what areas have been changed, modified, enhanced. So with that, let's jump into the 5,000 elite 24 BS and, and uh, 12 month bank statement, look at some high level uh, characteristics. You'll find that the 12 and 24 month bank statement maximum LTV on these loans are 70 LTV and up to two and a half million. 
the minimum FICO score for this program under the bank statement programs is 700, as you will find on the matrices. So the borrowers that have less than 700 FICO score would not qualify for the bank statement elite programs. I do want to also let you know, just so you're aware, there are very little to no exceptions on the elite program. So FICO score exceptions, LTV exceptions, none of the typical exceptions that you'll find on other bank statement programs, you will not find them as being viable under the elite program. The borrower either meets the requirements or not. We are not going to be looking at the level of exceptions that we do on the other programs. So please note, requesting them may actually be a waste of time altogether. It's important to realize a few elements in this mix uh, of the elite program. And by looking at the guidelines, you will find on page four of 12 on the elite bank statement programs, you'll find some criteria, credit criteria towards the bottom that's very important to be aware of. What you have is you have in that matrix for requirements for FICO housing, BK, foreclosure, and short sale, you'll find that, as I mentioned earlier, the minimum 700 FICO score, but all of those characteristics of bankruptcies, foreclosure, and short sale have a minimum five-year seasoning requirement. Again, no exception. Again, this is why the program's called Elite. It's basically geared towards a borrower that has superior credit history, no foreclosures in the last five years, and so on. The other aspect of the uh, elite program to be aware of is that the way that we calculate and the documentation that we require is different on the elite bank statement compared to our other bank statement programs. Now, before I go into our guidelines for the elite bank statement calculations, it's important to understand and again, remind you of what we typically require on our other bank statement programs. So I'm going to now jump away from the elite program and discuss what our standard guidelines for bank statement loans have been, and then I'm gonna come back and compare them to what the elite program is. The traditional bank statement program, which includes the 5,012 PS, the 5,024 BS, and the 5,024 BS non-prime, NP, our standard bank statement options, there are three categories. The three categories are the use of personal bank statements to average deposits as a way of determining and calculating monthly income. And that's used, personal bank statements are used in that calculation when a borrower has separate business and personal bank statements. And we typically require three months business bank statements along with a, with a 24 months or 12 months bank statements, personal, in order to make sure that the borrower actually has a separate business and personal and there's no commingling going on. And we just want to track the funds going from the business into the personal just to verify that's where the source of the deposits are. The second option is the use of business bank statements and the business bank statements require a accountant prepared P&L. That's calculated by the gross deposits on the business bank statements for the 24 month period being equal to or within a reasonable 5% margin of the gross income. So the gross deposits, if you total up all the deposits for on a business bank statements for 24 months, the gross income should be very similar to the gross deposits. The concept is how can you have more income than what you're depositing? So that's the logic and the correlation between those two. However, the borrower provides unaudited expenses to the accountant to determine the gross income minus expenses, creating the net income, which is unknown until this P&L is prepared, and the net income divided by 24 determines the borrower's monthly income to qualify. The third option 
is in, in the case where the first scenario that I mentioned, where the borrower has personal bank statements but does not have any separate business bank statements. That's called commingled bank statements. That's a case where a borrower is using their personal account to also run their business. So there's really no way to know what's really personal income and what's really business income, and we have no idea of what expenses are paid. So a P&L on the personal bank statement that's commingled is required just like a business bank statement. You find a lot of people that are consultants or service providers not necessarily having separate business bank statements. Quite often we find that when we condition for business bank statements separately from personal bank statements under option one, where they're trying to qualify off of personal bank statements, we find that there's feedback that that borrower actually doesn't even have any business bank statements. And then as a result of that, option one, use of personal bank statements to calculate income actually becomes option three, which is commingled personal bank statements treated much like business bank statements. So the, the variation of the personal bank statements and the use of that for income calculation changes depending on whether the borrower does in fact have a separate business account where they run their business through, or if they're using personal bank statements to run the personal expenses and income and business concurrently. So the reality is that the current programs that we have offered, the ones, the option two and three, require a CPA prepared P&L in order to complete the P&L and determine the net income, which leads us to the average monthly income for the borrower. Now, understanding that applies to all except the elite bank statement programs. We're gonna now jump back into the elite program and understand how that is going to be different. The elite program has a totally different criteria. The, the, the different criteria that it has is that effectively, we're no longer going to be asking for a CPA prepared P&L. We will actually take a P&L directly from the borrower with the same logic and same similar calculations. However, we require the P&L, borrower prepared P&L, on all three scenarios, while we would not typically under the other programs that I just mentioned, we do not ask for a P&L when a borrower is using personal bank statements and they have separate business statements. As a result, on the elite program, it makes it a lot easier to provide a profit on loss statement. However, if a borrower has personal and business separate bank statements, when they provide the bank statements for their personal to use for income calculation, we will still require a P&L. In the case of business bank statements, we're also gonna require that P&L. And in the third scenario, where they actually have a personal statement that is representative of both their business and personal, we will also have a P&L requirement similarly. Now, the reality is that in certain cases, those do not correlate to any numbers. Like I said before, when you're using business bank statements, the gross deposits tie into the gross income on a profit and loss. However, in the case of using personal bank statements and a P&L, the concept is that the net income on the P&L provided by the borrower should come to the same average deposits that are being represented on the personal bank statements. For example, if 24 months personal bank statements are provided and the average deposits are determined to be $1,000 a month for 24 month period, it would be expected that it's very likely that the profit and loss statement that's also provided by the borrower would show for a 24 month period, $24,000 net income. So if you took the net income, you would basically come to the same $1,000 a month average deposit that you're seeing on the personal bank statements. On a case by case, there may be requirements to also see 
anticipate seeing a requirement for three months business bank statements, again, just like the other program, just to show the separation between the personal and the business. There are cases where the net income on a P&L using a personal bank statement could actually be higher than the average deposits. For example, a borrower may be actually having higher net income, but actually not transferring the money from the business into their personal. That would lead to potentially a higher uh, asset amount buildup in their business account. Those are possibilities for exceptions in these cases. I do want to bring something very important to your attention that seems to be an overall concern on bank statement loans across the board. We take this, these calculations to determine the income. However, the initial loan application signed by the borrower with the income on the 1003 is also taken into consideration. Reason being is that's when the loan is originated and the borrower is telling us that their income is at a certain level. If that income that's represented on the 1003 on the initial loan application is actually higher than the actual calculation as a result of bank statement formulas and P&Ls and all the things that we're talking about, we take the lower of the two. That always seems to be okay. However, the problem lies when the initial 1003 has very li limited income stated because a lot of originators don't realize that we look at that. As a result, they don't really care to get accurate information and initial loan applications are submitted with income that doesn't make any sense. They just assume that we're gonna automatically be looking at the bank statement formula and it doesn't matter what the loan application has for income. Unfortunately, in the case of ability to repay, and unfortunately the reality that at some point the borrowers could use the loan application against us as a lender, it's important for us to be sensitive to what they have signed on their initial loan application and the amount that they stated. And the reason for that is in the future, if there is a problem with the loan, they could potentially, if there was a case of foreclosure, come back and use the initial 1003 to indicate that they originally stated their income and we ignored it. Meaning that we were aware that the borrower felt that the income that was on the initial loan application was basically low and we ignored it and created our own calculations and made them uh, a loan and approved a loan based on false calculations. That's the reason that it's very important on the initial loan application that the calculation, that's the numbers that are placed on the loan application, that those income is not ignored. In the case of calculation of bank statements, formulas, P&Ls, whatever is used, average deposits, when we determine that and compare it to the initial loan application, we will be forced to take the lower of the two. In other words, if the borrowers actually stated $1,000 on the loan application a month, which doesn't make any sense, but the calculation of income on a P&L and bank statements comes to 10,000, we have to take the $1,000 stated income that they put on and they initially submitted, originated the loan with. And in many cases, the borrower does not qualify. There are exceptions where we will actually get notarized documents from borrower and broker that they were not aware of that and they have made uh, mistakes in submission of the file and that they're not being uh, directed to change their income. But those, that's on an exception basis and that's not something we wanna do on a regular basis. It's important that we educate our uh, relationships that it's very important that originators are sensitive to the stated income on their initial loan application. With that said, let's move on to some of the other characteristics that are on the matrix on the bank statement program. As you can see, and as I stated earlier, uh, we do allow financing only up to 70% loan to value. So it's important to understand that at 700 FICO score on a purchase rate and term, 
we are going to do 70% to 2 million. And at 720 FICO score, we'll do 70% to 2.5 million on a purchase rate and term. This program has a cash out feature as well as an interest only feature. The only problem with the interest only option is it's not allowed on a cash out loan. As a result, you would have the interest only option only available on a purchase rate and term. It's also available on a non-owner occupied program limited to 55 LTV at 740, 55 LTV to a million and a half, and 65 LTV with 720 FICO score up to a million. Again, the elite program provides superior pricing even on this non-owner occupied that's not comparable to the other bank statement programs. Different profile borrower. So this creates an opportunity to capture a lot of business for high tier borrowers that may have the need for bank statement programs and have even investment properties or second homes. You'll find we also do second homes up to 70 LTV up to a million with a 720 FICO score. Something important I want to point out regarding this program, the elite program, which is important to recognize in income calculations. So in a case where you do have an interest only loan, it's important to be aware that the actual payment that's used in determining the DTI is not the interest only payment. It's actually the payment after the 10 year interest only period has ended. In a traditional 30 year amortized loan, when you have an interest only option, that means the borrower is effectively after the 10 years is gonna to have to repay the loan in the remaining 20 year period. That payment is actually a lot higher than it would be on a regular 30 year amortized loan. That's the reason that the DTI jumps up on an interest only loan because the payment after the 10 years with a 20 year remaining amortization is actually used to calculate the DTI. We have to take the worst case scenario. You obviously don't have that issue on a fully amortized loan. Comparing the elite to the alternative programs, there are options being made available through the other programs that address this issue with a 40 year amortization and interest only. That's something to compare between the different programs. The elite does not offer at the present time a 40 year amortization while we are making the 40 year amortization available on our 5024 BS and the 24 B BS NP. And that program will allow an ability to overcome that calculation that I mentioned earlier that will typically bump the DTI up. So on the non-elite programs, using a 40-year IO program, after the initial 10 years interest only, you have 30 years remaining bringing that payment down and making that DTI a lot better. It's important to realize the elite does not have, and I want to reiterate, at the present time, the elite program does not have the 40-year amortization for the IO program available. I also want to remind you as part of the release of the new guidelines, and on these programs that we're talking about on all, on all programs, you will also find a couple of changes. Our minimum company, minimum loan amount has increased to 150,000. We will consider going down to as low as 100,000 on an exception basis only. The other factor that you need to be aware of, which is very positive, which is the change you will find on most of the programs and guidelines. Previously, we required two appraisals on all loan amounts equal to or greater than a million. You will find in the appraisal section that that has been modified to be a million and a half. So two appraisals will only be required once you hit a million and a half instead of the original million that you used to see previously. These are some enhancements you will find in the programs you'll find in the guidelines, it's, it's important to recognize some of the elements that are in the elite program. For example, you'll also find that under first time home buyers that are allowed, they are not allowed interest only options. 
and they're limited. First-time home buyers are limited to primary residence only, and the reserve requirements for first-time home buyers under the elite bank statement programs are six months PITI reserves. So there are some elements for first-time home buyers, although allowed, first-time home buyers are allowed under elite. There are certain limitations to be aware of and monitored while they do not apply to some of the other programs. With that being said, I'm going to jump forward to some of the changes on the pre-existing programs and make sure you're aware of those. I'm going to start with a 12-month Bank Statement Plus program and acknowledge some of the highlighted areas that have changed in these programs. On the PLUS program, we have actually changed the housing event and bankruptcy also to a five-year period. However, the 12-month BS PLUS program compared to the elite only requires a 680 FICO score compared to 700 on the elite program. So the PLUS program has flexibility on the FICO score and does go up to 80 LTV while the elite will only go to 70 LTV. So lower, 20 points lower on the FICO score, and it allows up to 80 LTV, 10% higher LTV. That would be the case to use the 12 BS Plus compared to the elite 12-month bank statement program. You will also find on this program, reserve requirements have been reduced. You'll find that under the million to million and a half category, they've been re reserves have been reduced to nine months compared to previously at a higher level. So these reserves have been reduced. LTVs you'll find, for example, a million and a half under the 12 BS, you can actually obtain financing up to 80 LTV with 720 FICO score with loan amounts greater than a million and a half. So the 12 BS does provide some higher LTV options uh, as well as higher at higher loan amounts, that combination as well. Again, 12 BS has also uh, the 12 BS Plus has also changed, as I mentioned earlier, where we will require two appraisals at a million and a half or higher. So you do have that flexibility where only um, one appraisal up to up to less than a million and a half falls into place under the 12 BS. Jumping ahead, I'm going to point out also on the program 5024 BS you'll find that we now offer under this program 90% LTV with 24 months bank statement with a 720 FICO score. It's important to recognize this. It puts us in a completely different category offering 10% down on a bank statement program up to a million dollar loan amount. That's on a purchase and rate and term. It's important to recognize that. In addition, under the 5024 BS, you'll actually find that we allow second homes and investment properties up to 80 LTV, max LTV, and you'll find that two to four unit properties, we allow up to 85 LTV. Again, increase in LTV on condos, we allow up to 85 on condos, and non-warrantables have gone up to 80 LTV as well. So on a regular warrantable condo, we'll go to 85. On a non-warrantable condo, will go to 80. You will also see the highlights of the loan amounts that have all increased across the board, max loan amount that the LTVs represented. On the 5,024 BS, just like the prior programs, two appraisals required a million and a half or higher. Important to recognize that. Cash out amounts on these programs have been modified to be a percentage of the appraisal as opposed to a dollar amount uh, pertaining to eat the cash out amount. So it's all a percentage of the overall value of the property as a determination of max cash out allowed. You'll also find some explanation about cash out requirements on these guidelines. And you will also find some changes that are made with regards to uh, credit profiles that are highlighted as discussed below. One of the important areas to be aware of in the way that we're looking at reserves 
typically um, we were not allowing or required an exception to use cash out towards reserve requirements. It's important to, in the case of on the 5024 BS, you'll find a highlighted section under reserves, page 9 of 10, which I'm going to outline, is it's indicating a minimum of six months reserves are required for owner-occupied and second homes. LTVs greater than 85 require 12 months reserves. And we're addressing that cash out issue being used as reserves by a formula and some specific directions. Cash out proceeds can be used um, for required reserves if the following requirements are met. Cash out must be used for debt consolidation. No new obligations can be incurred with loan proceeds. Net cash out may be used to meet reserve requirements if at least one of the following criteria are met. Aggregate monthly debt obligations are reduced by a minimum of 15%, or aggregate monthly debt obligations are reduced by a minimum of $500. Monthly mortgage obligation on subject property is reduced by a minimum of 10%, and housing history is 1 times 30 or better. Gift funds may not be used for reserve requirements. And then it's important to recognize that we require two months of reserve for each finance property. Total reserve requirements not to exceed 12 months. The reason being is that if you have a borrower that has multiple investment properties, we don't want to create a massive requirement for reserves, and we cap that at the 12 months um, total. You will also find on the loan amount and reserves for non-owner occupied under this program, there are some specific guidelines for reserves that are being identified when financing investment properties. You will also find specific sections with regards to tax liens and under what circumstances they will be allowed. So you'll find all in that section, page 10 of 10, all income tax liens must be paid off prior to or at loan closing. Tax liens that do not impact title may remain open provided the following are met. The file must contain a copy of the repayment agreement. A minimum of six months payment has been made under the plan. And the balance of the lien must be included when determining the max CLTV for the program. Refinance transactions require a subordination agreement from the taxing authority. So in the case of calculating the tax liens for CLTV, we would obviously calculate that into the CLTV formula, and it cannot exceed the guideline max. For example, if the loan is 70% LTV and the program allows up to 80 CLTV, including the tax liens along with the first mortgage that we're providing, the overall CLTV on this loan cannot exceed 80. We're treating the tax liens almost like a silent second or a HELOC. So it has to be calculated in the formula. It's important to recognize that. Jumping ahead, last program we're going to discuss is the 5024 BSNP program. That's our non-prime program where we allow as low as 580 FICO score up to 80 LTV. Loan amounts have been increased. You will find the maximum loan amounts. Now we allow at 580 FICO score up to a million loan amount where previously it was lower. This program allows both primary and second home for purchase rate and term and cash out refinance. It's important to realize that this non-prime program does not have an I.O. feature. The reason being is non-prime borrowers historically, as it pertains to ATR, have not demonstrated the ability to repay, and interest only is believed to put them in an inferior position and could potentially burden them in the future after the interest-only feature has ended. As such, non-prime programs, as perceived to be non-prime, do not allow the I.O. feature, and that's not an exception to be considered. It's important to realize on this program as well that we do have max cash out limits on this program where previously we had discussed cash out being a percentage of the overall value. So it's, it's imperative to recognize the differences between these programs and how they apply to cash out and other calculations. Again, the cash out limits on these programs have been increased, um, as well as the loan maximum loan amounts that are allowed. 
further changes into this 24BS non-prime program, you'll find that on page two of nine, you'll find that the, the loan amount and reserve requirements at the different DTI levels have reduced. So on the non-prime program, loan amounts at a million or less are currently now reduced to three months with DTI 43% or less, nine months at fi up to 50 DTI. So it's important to realize that these reserve requirements that have hindered us previously and, and have created exceptions are being dealt with in this manner with reduced requirements. Again, this program also has the second appraisal being required at loan amounts equal to greater than a million and a half. Similar requirements as they pertain to use of uh, cash out and effectively as it pertains to the section that I'm turning to, which is how we handle tax liens unlike, uh, which is on page nine of nine, which is which was um, previously not in our guidelines, which has now been added into the actual guidelines for determination of what would be allowed and what would not be. So this program also has the guidelines as it pertains to the tax liens and the calculation of the CLTV, similarly to what I mentioned previously. So with that being said, this is the end of the update and the training on the, the new elite bank statement programs, as well as update on the guideline changes on the prior programs. I do want to remind you that we previously did have a 5,024 BS plus, and as part of the new guidelines, that product has been dropped. So at this point, these guidelines represent five separate bank statement programs with the introduction of the elite program representing two 12-month bank statement programs and three 24-month bank statement programs starting from the elite 24-month bank statement all the way down to our 24-month BS non-prime product. I will allow and wait for another minute for any questions that you may have. Please access the GoToMeeting and you can actually ask your question via chat if there's anyone that has any questions. So we're going to go silent for a minute or two to see if there are any questions regarding the existing programs. I do want to mention that you can always email me directly subsequent to this call, and I can answer any questions you may have regarding the programs. So we're gonna be on mute for a minute or two to see if there are any calls, any further questions regarding these programs. And if not, then uh, I will come back and end the, the call. So please uh, hold while we determine any questions. Okay, one of the questions I've been asked, uh, getting back, one of the questions I've been asked is with regards to addressing the cash out uh, aspect of the bank statement programs between the regular 24 month bank statement program and uh, the NP program. So the 5,024 BS uh, allows for the cash out limit to be calculated as a percentage of the overall value. So 
regardless of the actual dollar amount. So the calculation is capped at a certain dollar at, at a certain percentage of the overall value on the property on the 5024 BS. On the non-prime program there's actually some hard calculations and max cash outs regardless of percentages. So if you look at the 5,024 BS NP, we have actually listed max cash out dollar amounts. As such, with a 580 FICO score cash out on a primary or second home, the max LTV 70, the max loan amount 750, and there's a hard stop at 300,000 max cash out. It's not calculated as a percentage of the value, but an actual max dollar amount allowed on the program. That's one question that was asked. Another question that was asked is, how do we use a co-borrower's salary income on bank statement programs? That's actually a very good question because our programs actually allow on a bank statement loan, you could have a primary borrower that is self-employed and you could have a co-borrower that is actually a W-2 borrower. Obviously, we're not going to have tax returns in the file. And what is used for a W-2 borrower would be standard income documentation where the primary borrower would have the normal requirements for the bank statement calculations and worksheets. And the co-borrower would have to provide W-2s, two years W-2s, year-to-date pay stub showing year-to-date income and the calculations would be there. What's important to realize in the case of a married couple where you have the W-2 income being deposited on the bank statements that are now being used for the self-employed borrower, we would back those out because that would actually represent double income if we gave the co-borrower the W-2 income as well as the deposits that are showing up on the bank statements used by the primary borrower. So those are cases where we have used, uh, we have had and have used both the bank statement program and a hybrid full doc a co-borrower to qualify for a bank statement loan. Again, the co-borrower being a W-2 borrower only, and we would only be using the W-2 and pay stubs in order to qualify. At this point, one of the other questions, do we still require proof of 12 months rental income if a borrower is using rental income to qualify or is a lease alone sufficient? That's an excellent question as well. In the case of a borrower that is actually using uh, rental income as part of their REOs, in other words, we, we get borrowers that are using a bank statement program, but effectively at the same time, they do have investment properties. The income is from their primary business, but on the rental properties, the income cannot really be calculated unless we get supporting documentation. Those are cases where the income that's being applied to the calculations on the rental properties have to be verified several different ways. They cannot be taken at face value and a lease is not sufficient for that. We would actually need to show that the income, the rental income that they're using um, and being applied for the calculations and determining if there's any negative rents is actually separately income calculated, separate from their bank statement income calculation. In other words, their primary business is, is being used for income calculation. And if that income from the rental property is already going into that bank statement calculation, we would not want to give them double the income. Without that information being provided and that separate source of income for the rental uh, deposits being verified, we would have to put the rental income at zero and hit them with a full mortgage payment on their investment properties because we're assuming that all the income is already represented in the bank statement calculations. Their primary business as personal income and rental income are all in there. It's important to notify all parties of this calculation so that it can be addressed properly and the documentation can be provided. At this point, those were the outstanding questions. 
So we're going to end this call. I appreciate everyone getting on the call, and uh, we will uh, be back on a follow-up call on Thursday at 3. Thank you.